Someday we'll use the whiteboard too, but it has its advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so where we're going this morning, or from any questions you'd like to put on the board in the chat or audio. So if you have any questions you want to put on the board, you just throw them into the chat or speak them out. I, I know there are limitations on speaking because of the time delay and such like that. So sometimes if you have to get something important in there, you might have to throw it in the chat. This is what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to remind you of some key analogies between points and lines in the plane. And points, lines, and planes in space. So you have a lot of intuition built up in the plane and we want to use that intuition to our advantage. And then we'll be able to extend that to introduce this morning the quadric surfaces and make some very cool graphs. So just a little tour of our website as a shortened start to the morning. Sorry about that. This is under the category of finishing up some things I wanted to say in section 2.5. And this is section 2.6. So last time you know that I did not effectively record that session. And that happens from time to time. I just have to make sure that I've got everything under control. Now, on your Zoom session, you see other people and their names. You don't have to check in with video. You see my whiteboard, you see my camera, if I turned on, you'd see me, which I'm not that beautiful. So I usually leave that off. You can select any screen you want to look at in the Zoom session. Maybe you're used to that by now, but I want to record my paper. I want to record the screens I share. And last time I did not have my paper effectively recorded for the first hour of the two hours. And that really messed that up. I pointed out in an email that you could consume things by using a combination of the notes and the audio recording, but that's not super duper either. So I wanna make sure I share some things with you visually from section 2.5, some things that would be valuable to add to the discussion. So let's start off with a tiny game here. If you'll indulge me, now, who wants to be a mathematician millionaire? Let me give you the scenario that you have in the plane, in the X, Y plane, we'll use traditional letters, a line that you want to describe. And uh, I could do all sorts of things. I could tell you the intercepts, I could tell you points, I could tell you slope and point, but you've learned four different ways to present the equation of a line over your career. Some of them are more famous than others, but I'm going to begin the analogy this morning by asking you which one of these four is the most valuable. So, I 
there's the a x over a plus y over b equals one version. There's the y equals mx plus b version. Now, when I'm using these letters, I sometimes use letter b in two cases, but that doesn't mean it's the same letter. Doesn't mean it's the same variable, but sometimes it is. Uh, there's the ax plus by equals c version. And there's the uh, famous y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 version. So let's play who wants to be a mathematician millionaire. If there are any uh, volunteers, you can step up in the chat, but you have to tell me which one of these four equations of lines is the most valuable. Which one of these is hands down the most valuable and you get a 50-50 and you get to uh, consult with your friends. Any takers, now, just to remind you the names, this first version is called the intercepts version because what it does is displays the X intercept at A and the Y intercept at B. If you know the X and Y intercept of a line, you can write the equation of the line in this form by saying X over X intercept plus Y over Y intercept equals one. The second contender, is the famous slope intercept form. This also displays the y intercept and the slope m, slope rise over run of a line. You're familiar with the word slope. Number c, contender c is called the general equation of the line. ax plus by equals c. You call this uh, in mathematics, it's like a, call this a linear combination of x and y to the first power equals this constant c. And the fourth version of the line equation is called the point slope equation. If you know the slope of your line and you know a point x1, y1 on the line, then you can construct the equation of the line in this form. So I'm gonna label this line with these qualities. Let's say this is x1, y1. Let's say that this is a and b. And then we have this concept of a line called, sorry, I gotta make sure I don't jiggle the screen when I'm doing this. Rise over run. I don't know how to picture that super nicely, but let's call it m. Okay, anyone you want to step up and win a million bucks? Like I said, you get 50-50 and you get to phone your friend. So you should be able to narrow these down. Which one of these is the most valuable line? If no one steps up, I'll ask if someone would like to volunteer. Tolu, you can pop into the chat, 50-50, okay. 50-50, Tolu, I will say, let's cross out this one and this one. Now you can, everybody's got their favorites, right? And I've got champions for all four of these lines. I got people who would die on the hill of this line is more important than the others. Sure, I could probably make a case for all four. But I'm saying from my perspective, from our perspective in this class, and generally acknowledged to be the most powerful version. So now I've got you down to the general equation of the line and the slope intercept form of the line. So uh, you want to phone some friends, Tolu. Or do you want to consult some friends? And now you could consult the friends in the chat and they could pop in with a B or C any way they want to do it or Maybe you want to just pick one off the top of your head. Uh, Tolu, pick C. 
C is called the general form of the equation of the line. Are you absolutely certain about that, Tolu? I mean, in this game on TV, I don't have time to do this, but they rag you for the next five minutes, right? C, final answer, Tolu. Is that your final answer? Okay, now, how am I gonna pay you off in the million dollars right here? I mean, you guys have heard of cryptocurrencies. I'm gonna to pay Tolu off if he wins in cryptocurrencies. But I haven't implemented my cryptocurrency yet. My cryptocurrency is this. My mascot is a cat. As opposed to that other famous cryptocurrency supported by that other megalomaniac. My cryptocurrency is pronounced Kitai coin. It is not, many uninitiated people say kitty coin, but my cryptocurrency is called Kitai coin. Okay, Tolu, I've been giving you a chance to think about this. Final answer, is your final answer C, Tolu, are you certain? Tolu? You just won 500,000 Kitai coins. Now there's a catch. Kitai coins are a mathematical cryptocurrency and they haven't been implemented yet. But if you ever see me implement Kitai coins in the blockchain, you will have this recording as uh, proof that I owe you 500,000 Kitai coins. The answer is C. That is the most valuable equation of a line. And let me show you why. It's the most valuable equation of a line because it is the one that extends best to space. So I have my little schematic diagram here, right? And I'm gonna use this in solutions and I'm gonna use this in presentations. When someone says schematic diagram, a schematic, is a diagram not to represent the physical trueness of the object necessarily, but to represent the general properties of the object. So right over here, I am not talking about any one particular line. I haven't given you any scale. This is a pretty useless graph. I just wrote down things to represent properties of that line. Let's actually go do a line. So I'm gonna put a point here at two, one. And I'm gonna put a point here at five, three. And I want you to give me the equation of that line in all four of these formats. And then I'll show you what this has to do with space. So my x-axis and my y-axis, having given you two points, probably you might favor the point slope form because you can easily identify a slope of this line. The slope of this line, let's say I got my point P, I got my point Q, P is two, one, and Q is five, three, you can easily identify the slope of this line is two over three. You rise two units every time you go to the right three units. Now, notice I didn't use any formula to calculate that. I just used my, this time, accurate picture. And then you have all kinds of tricks for drawing them. You just say, oh, I'll repeat that two over three pattern. And you repeat that two over three pattern left and right. If you want, you can slip in some midpoints. And now you've drawn an awesome line. But I haven't given you the equation line, I've just drawn it. So let's say, let's take off D right here. Equation D would be Y minus, I pick one of these points, one equals two thirds times
times x minus 2. Now that is the equation of that black line. Let's call this line L. But it's not an effective equation of the line because it's kind of mixed up. It's not simplified. You're usually used to marching on to equation B. Let's get the slope intercept form. I can already fill in the two thirds X because the two thirds X is a slope. How do I fill in the intercept? Well, I could simplify this equation. I got minus four thirds on the right. I got minus three thirds on the left. If I add three thirds to both sides, I get minus one third. Now, a lot of people favor this equation of the line and rightly so, because they consider it the equation of the line that can easily graph things. While that's true, it's also an equation of the line that really can dig you into a fraction hole. And it's sometimes distracting to be able to deal with fractions. Let's move on to equation A. Equation A says, let's display the intercepts for the whole world to see. And the value of equation A, displaying the intercepts is I already have the y-intercept, minus one third. But I also have the x-intercept because remember, I have this point minus one, minus one, and I have this point two and one. Halfway between minus one and two is negative, I'm sorry, positive one half. This is three steps. And if I go one and a half steps to the right, I'll be at one half on the x-axis. And you see by the equal height above and below, I'm at zero on the y-axis. So these are the three equations of the lines that I discarded. What is the fourth equation and why is it so valuable? The general equation is the most powerful in part because it describes every line, even the oddball lines. So if you think about that, equation B would fail if I had zero slope. Well, it would pronounce y equals b. That's a legitimate equation of a line. But what would happen if I had the other extreme, infinite slope? If I had an equation of a line like x equals 2, that's just a vertical line through x equals 2, this equation could not produce it. Likewise, the first equation could not produce a vertical line. Because the first equation produced a vertical line, well, vertical line has no y-intercept, so I have nothing to put in b. This equation would also fail, in a sense, to produce a vertical line, because a vertical line has no slope. I can't put in infinity for slope. I can't put in zero, because zero is flat. Now, actually, c is the only one of the four that covers every single line. Now, it's easy to find out what C is, and you could use any one of these lines to find out what C is. That's probably your natural pattern, but I'm gonna show you the slickest way to find C. Let's go back to the picture and focus on the vector from P to Q. And the vector from P to Q, you can read from the drawing, it's actually the numbers I use to construct the slope, right? Three units to the right and two units up. So let me ask you a question. In the plane, this is not a hard question to solve. Can you give me a vector that's naturally perpendicular to three units right and two units up? Well, because I'm only dealing with a plane and because I know the perfect test for perpendicular, that means dot product equals zero. I could easily invent numbers that I dot with three and two to give me zero. Simplest way is to reverse the two numbers. Now three, two dotted with two, three actually gives me 12, not zero. So I can't just reverse the two numbers. I actually have to reverse the two numbers and change one of the signs. 
sorry, I got to work on my paper sliding up. If I switch these two numbers and change one of the signs, and either one will do, do you see that I'll get a minus six plus six, which is zero? So what is this vector right here? This vector is not along the line. This vector is perpendicular to the line. So let's just say that I've identified the vector perpendicular to the line as minus two and three. You also understand I could identify a vector perpendicular to the line as two and minus three. This is another perpendicular. Well, now I'm gonna tell you the equation of that line L in black. It's negative two X plus three Y equals negative one. Negative two X plus three Y equals negative one. How did I come up with that? And this is the value of this form of the line. And this is the utility that we're going to use. I said this at the very end last time, and now I want to highlight it. If I pick a point x comma y on this line, how does that point qualify to be on the line? Well, it ought to create a vector that's somehow perpendicular to a normal vector, right? If this point doesn't land on this line, then any vector I create with this point won't be perpendicular. Let's go to the point two one here from x, y. Let's look at this vector right here. Let's call it u from x, y to two, one. Let's go from x, y point to two, one point and create that vector. So that gives me the vector two minus x and one minus y. Notice that you always subtract from terminal point minus initial point. That gives you that direction of the vector. The other way would give you the other direction, which is just as good, but I'm gonna take this forward direction right here. So now I need to dot that with minus two and three. And here's the test if X, Y lies on that line. If X, Y lies on the line, that's dot product gotta be zero. So let's work this out. What I get here, I get minus two times two minus X and I get three times one minus y equals zero. And now let me resist the urge to just multiply these out in this fashion. What I want to do is organize these, say minus two times two plus two times x. Here I'll say plus three times y. plus three times minus y equals zero. And I'll collect the constants on one side and I'll collect the x and y pieces on the other side. When I collect the x and y pieces, let's say on the right, I get negative two x because I moved it to the right. My camera might go off here, but I'll try to keep moving. And I get positive three Y because I moved negative three Y to the right. On this side, I get negative two times two. And I get three times one. Okay, somehow what we got here is some like energy saving device in my office, which turns off the lights if I don't move enough three times one. When I simplify that, I get negative two X plus three Y and I get negative four plus three is negative one. But look at this stage right here. This stage displays the normal vector on both sides. Do you see the minus two and three that was the normal vector? You see the minus two and three that was the normal vector on this side. Both sides display the normal vector. 
What's the difference between two sides? In this side, I'm dotting the normal vector with the generic x, y. And on this side, I'm dotting the normal vector with two and one. This produces a number. And this produces in total the equation of the line, negative 2x plus 3y equals negative one. This doesn't look like a time saver yet, but be patient with me. Now, when you give the general form of the equation of the line, there's a couple of rules. And the rules are, when you give the equation of a line in general form, ax plus by equals c. I'm gonna move this up and get to the next paper right here. that A, B, and C have to be integers. Don't do this with fractions. I understand you could have taken equation number B and moved the minus two thirds X to appear, say two thirds X negative appears on the left. Then you would have had negative two thirds X plus Y equals negative one third. Now, someone could say that that's general form, but it's not for two reasons. General form does not have fractions as coefficients because fractions as coefficients is distracting. The next rule for general form is that you should lead with a positive number. You always lead with a positive number. So the equation of this line, and let me draw this line very carefully again through two, one and five, three, I'll put some generic scale on here, like three and three. I'll put some generic names like X and Y. And I can mark all these points. The equation of this line is two X minus three Y equals one. What's another cool thing about the general form of a line? The general form of a line is very easy to test points in. Right, you got the point two one. Does the point two one make this sentence true? Four minus three is one. Yes. How about the point five three? Does the point five three make this sentence true? Ten minus nine is one. Yes. Even down here, minus one comma minus one. Does that point belong on the line? Yes or no? Negative two plus three is one. Yes. How about this point? One and minus one. Does that point belong on the line? Well, no one can lie to you, because if you test this point, you get two plus three is five, not one. So this point does not belong on that line. Let me show you another really cool factor about this line. What if you wanted the line perpendicular to this line? through two seven. Let's make that green. The line perpendicular to this line through two seven. And two seven must be way up here. <coughs> well, in those other forms of the line, point slope and stuff, then you'd have to work out what perpendicular means. You have to find the slope and you'd have to find perpendicular, but remember the normal. The normal to this line is two minus three. In fact, when I'm presented with a line in this fashion, I can read the normal just by reading off the numbers, two minus three. So what's perpendicular to the normal two minus three? It's the normal three, two. So I want to go through this point and have a normal of three over and two up. Now remember that that looks parallel, but I want this to be my normal. It's going to be perpendicular to the line. So the line is going to be coming in like this. So what's the equation of that line? 3x plus 2y equals 20. How did I find the 20 so fast? I just plugged in the 2 and 7. 
right? I know that the line has to begin ax plus by, 3x plus 2y. I know that from the normal. And then the only question is what number appears on the right? Well, the number that appears on the right has to make 2, 7 work. That means kind of circular reasoning, it sounds like. But you just plug 2 and 7 in here. You get 6 plus 14 is 20. Let's find the line parallel to 3x minus 5y equals 7 and through negative 1, negative 3. Do you remember those equations in your algebra class? Well, now they're the simplest equations in the universe because parallel to this general form will have the same normal. The normal to this line is 3 minus 5. So parallel to that line, that means same slope. Now I want you to say same normal. So parallel to that line is 3x minus 5y equals. And now I just have to satisfy this point. Plug this point in here, and I get negative 3 plus 15, which is 12. You see that that was instant. So with the general form of a line, if you're willing to think not the key idea is slope, but the key idea is normal. Then that opens up the door to describe line very, very simply. Now let's take it to space so I can show you what I'm referring to. Excuse me with the advancing of the paper. Let's do the plane through ABC. And let's let A, B, C be these points. These are points, one minus one, two, uh, four, three, one, zero minus one, five. And again, let's draw, I've introduced this word now, a schematic drawing. Here's a plane in space. I want to go through these three points. Move my paper. I could even put those three points on the board for you. But I'm not claiming that I'm making an accurate drawing here. A, B, C. And what do we need to do to find the equation of this line or this plane in space? Well, let's use the analogy of the line in the plane. I know that I could create a normal vector to this plane by just crossing A, B, and A, C. That'll create a normal vector to that plane. Normal, I indicate with these little right angle brackets. Let's call that M. And then let's use the same analogy that I did with the plane. Okay, so first of all, let's create A, B. <coughs> to go from A to B is three, four, minus one. Let's create AC. To go from A to C is minus one, zero, three. Now be really careful. If I just rip through that, well, it's very likely I'm gonna make an error, right? But you make sure that I did go from A to B and from A to C by taking three steps forward, four steps forward, one step backwards. There will be a safety check at the end. So that's why I'm not worried about moving quickly on that. Let's create the vector normal. Let's create AB cross AC. And that's gonna be first, we cover up this and we get 12 minus zero. And we cover up the middle and we get nine minus one, which is eight. But in the middle slot, we take the opposite. That's the rule for the cross product. And here I get, zero minus negative four, zero minus negative four is four. So guess what, game over. The equation of that plane is 12x minus eight y plus four z equals what?
what did we do with the line a second ago? I have three points that live on that plane. If this is truly the plane equation, all three of those points must fit. That means the number here is determined by those points. I'll take A. What's 12 times one? Minus eight times minus one. Plus four times two. Well, that's 12 plus eight plus eight. Is that 28? So here's the equation of that plane. 12x minus 8y plus 4z equals 28. That's an instant plane equation using not the concept of slope, because slope in a plane, well, that depends on which way you're looking at the plane. But the concept of normal on a plane is unique. I have normal above and normal below, but both of them are parallel. Now I'm going to make two comments about this answer before I continue. All three, all four of the numbers are integers. That's OK. If there's any common factor between the four numbers, I don't need to present that. So everybody here got a four. I think I'm going to simplify that equation to 3x minus 2y plus z equals seven. This is my plane equation. Now, how do I know I'm right? Well, I can't lie to you. I've got to fit the points A, B, and C, right? So I try these points A, B, and C. Two points determine a line, three points determine a plane. So if these three points fit, I'm right. So here I have three plus two, plugging in A. Three plus two plus two, three plus two plus two is seven. Let's plug in B. Put a four and a three and a one here. I get 12 minus six plus one. What's 12 minus six? Uh, six plus one is seven. B works. Let's plug in C. Zero minus one and five. Zero give me nothing. Minus one give me two. Five give me seven. Okay, so I found the equation of that plane very efficiently by creating a normal and just using that normal in the A, B, and C place. Let's do another problem. Let's find the line that uh, is parallel to the intersection of 3x minus y minus z equals 4, uh, x plus 2y plus 3z equals 5, and through the point, let's call it a Q is uh, minus one, four, seven. What I'm trying to do to you right now, which is really, really important, is I'm trying to make you think normals. Normals are the keys to describing planes simply in space. And planes in space are like lines in the plane. They're the kings of the one-dimensional universe inside the three-dimensional space. So let's do a schematic drawing. I must have one plane here. Let's call this plane, I don't know, plane one. Not very creative. And let's call this plane, plane two. And how do two planes intersect? Well, two planes must intersect in a line. Right, two planes cannot just touch in a single point. Now you're saying, 
oh, but two planes might not touch. Yeah, but how do I know that these two planes touch in a line? Maybe these two planes are parallel. Not a chance. Why? They have different normal vectors. The first thing I do when I look at a plane is suck out the normal vector. The normal vector to plane one, let's call it normal one, is three minus one minus one. The normal vector to plane two is, let's call it normal two, one, two, three. There's another reason why normal vectors are king. You can take them straight off the equation of the plane or in the plane, you could take them straight off the equation of the line. Okay, so now I've got this line of intersection between these. This is my schematic drawing, remember? And I've got my other point over here called Q. And Q was minus one, four, seven. How in my schematic drawing am I gonna find the line that goes through Q and is parallel to this line? What does parallel mean? In space, parallel lines mean same direction. I'm ruining my graphic with lots of scribbling, but I've got a plan now. And what's my plan? This first plane has a normal vector called N1. This second plane has a normal vector called N2. Both of those normal vectors, since this red line is contained in both planes, are perpendicular to the direction of the line. Let's call the direction of the line V. <coughs> so how do I discover a direction for the red line? I cross N1 and N2. Because if I said V equal to N1 cross N2, I automatically get something that's perpendicular to both N1 and N2. What would perpendicular to N1 and N2 be along the red line? Then I'll have a direction vector for my line through Q. Remember the equation of a line, you've been working on some of these, is base point minus one, four, seven, and direction vector times parameter T. I need to insert the direction vector right there. So let's cross N1 and N2. Uh, sometimes I like to cross them by setting them on top of each other like this. So I can just read the coordinates and N1 is three minus one minus one and N2 is one, two, three. Now you could say, oh, right-hand rule, uh, are you got this oriented properly? Well, that depends on how I look at this drawing. But remember, you put your fingers in the direction of right hand fingers, curl them, put your fingers in the direction of N1, curl them towards N2, and your thumb, which is pointing into the paper for me now, points along that red line. I'm not too worried about the orientation because even if I produce the vector on this side, it would still be a direction vector for that line. So let's compute my V right here. My V is cover up, let's not screw up. Let's cover up the X column, minus three, minus negative two, negative one. Middle slot, nine minus negative one is 10. But we take the opposite in the middle slot. And the last is six minus negative one is seven. If I want to know if I did this correctly, I could dot it with these two and see that I get zero. Negative three plus 10 minus seven is zero. Negative one minus 20 plus 21. Negative one minus 20 is negative 21 plus 21 is zero. So always perform that safety check. Well, now I know the equation of that line. Minus T minus 10 T and seven T. That line, and that's in the vector form, let me draw it over here. X, Y, Z is minus T minus one, minus 10 T plus four, and seven T 
plus seven. That's the parametric form of the equation of the line. Now, there was also two other forms of the equation of the line that you have to pay attention to. What will be more valuable to us in the future is the vector form of the equation of the line. In the vector form of the equation of the line, you present the direction vector and the base point in this fashion. Direction vector, T plus base point minus 147. And if you're like, you're allowed to put those together into one vector, negative T minus one, negative 10 T plus four, and 7t plus seven. So this is called the vector form of the equation of the line. And both of these two are used you know, equally well, but we're gonna start to work on the vector form a little more. The symmetric form of the equation of the line, everybody's got their champions, right? Symmetric form of the equation of the line is not my champion. <coughs> it has a value. It's kind of like the intercept form in two dimensions, but not really. So here's the symmetric form. The symmetric form, what you do is you solve for T. You present the line in terms of the parameter t. So let's solve for t right here. If I solve for t, I would say t is negative x minus one. Or I could say, I will say x plus one divided by negative one. If I solve for t right here, I will say y minus four divided by negative 10. And if I solve for t here, I will say z minus seven divided by seven. All three of these are legitimate presentations of that line, but generally we're gonna be hanging out in the vector form or the parametric form. And if you want to know what the champions of the symmetric form say, go look up the value of what the symmetric form is. I'm gonna come back to this problem again here. Notice when I found you the equation of the line parallel to this intersection, notice I did not find you the equation of the intersection. What's the equation of that red line? You need to know how to do this. So let me quickly execute the equation of that red line for you. How do you find the intersection of these two planes? I try to write too fast, and then I get a little bit messy. Well, basically, you solve a system of equations. Now you're used to solving system of equations like 3x minus 2y equals oh, 4 and uh, 5x plus y equals 11. You're used to solving equations like that in your sleep because these are two lines and in the plane, two lines must intersect in a point. So I don't mind how you do this at all. But whatever voodoo you do, do that. And the answer is 2, 1. These two lines must intersect in a single point. How do I know 2, 1 is the answer? Test it in both equations. I'm either lying or I'm telling the truth. But you could do this in multiple ways. You could say, oh, I'll multiply the first equation by 5 and the second equation by minus 3 to cancel out the x's. Then I'll cancel out the y's. Cancel the x's to find the y, cancel the y to find the x's. 
I don't mind how you do this problem. But it's called solving a system of equations. Let's see what would happen if I solve this system of equations. In a systematic way. So here's the two equations. Let's call them A and B. And let's solve them as if I was solving the system here by trying to eliminate variables. Let me take minus three times equation B and add it to equation A. That will be my new equation A. You can visualize doing that pretty simply. You will create no Xs. You will create minus seven Ys. And you will create minus 10 Zs. Of course, you have to work on the other side too to create the minus 11. You have to add three copies negative of the equation B to equation A. As long as you're adding a multiple of one equation to the other, one truth added to another still produces a truth. Now let's write down equation B as it is, which is X plus 2Y plus 3Z equals 5. I have a feeling this is not going to be pretty. Well, having eliminated Xs, in this game up here, our next step was to eliminate y's. Let's eliminate y's. Now eliminating y's means I got to add some multiple of this column, this first equation to the second equation, but it's kind of awkward because two and seven don't match beautifully. Well, let's just bite the bullet. Let's just multiply by two sevenths because that'll give me a negative two y that'll kill this positive two y. So let's do two sevens times equation A and add it to equation B, and that'll become my new equation B. Equation A, we're gonna leave alone. Ah, while we're at it, why don't we multiply equation B by, equation A by minus two sevens? That'll simplify equation A, won't it? If I multiply by minus two sevenths, what I create is a y minus two sevenths plus 20 sevenths z minus two sevenths equals 22 over seven. Now let's take equation a and multiply by two sevenths and dump it on equation b. 2 sevenths times equation A plus B, that'll be my new B. Of course, 2 sevenths times nothing plus X is just X. 2 sevenths times minus 7 is minus 2 Ys plus 2 Ys is no Ys. That was the goal, to kill the Ys. 2 sevenths on here will give me minus 20 sevenths Z plus 21 sevenths Z. What's minus 20 sevens plus 21 sevens? That's plus one seventh Z. Something smells wrong to me, but we're just gonna have to keep going and live with it. So here's minus 22 sevens, here's 35 sevens. What's negative 22 sevens plus 35 sevens? Negative 22 plus 35 is 13 sevens. Now this is solving the system. I've described X and Y in terms of Z. I'm a little bit upset about the numbers I'm getting because, but I'm gonna have to live with it and then go find the error if there is one. But do you see what I've written? I've written X is minus one seventh Z plus 13 sevenths. I've written y is minus 20 sevenths z plus 22 sevenths. And then you say, but you haven't told me what z is. That's because z can be anything I please. Z is parameter. 
Now, what I'd like is for it to compare favorably to that line that I had here. And what does compare favorably mean? Well, it better be parallel to that purple line that I created way up here, which was minus 1t, minus 10t, I'm taking it off the paper above me that you don't see, and 7t's plus 7 plus 4 minus 1. I've got two problems right here. Like, this looks like the equation of a line, base point direction vector. The base point is different. Well, I can choose the base point anywhere along the line, but these were different lines. Remember, this is line L2 above. What bothers me is the direction vector is wrong. This direction vector is minus 1, minus 20, and 1 times 7. You know, I could say minus 1 seventh, minus 20 sevenths, and 1. But I could just as well say minus 1, minus 20, and, my, and 7. That does not compare favorably to this direction vector, which was minus 1, minus 10, and 7. So that means I made some error in this calculation. Let's go up here and find the error. Here's my original two planes. This is what I used for my normals there and there. So these got to be good planes. Four and five were the constants on the other side. The first thing you do wrong is transfer them incorrectly to here, right? but it looks like I transferred them correctly. Now I did minus three times second equation plus first, zero, negative seven, negative 10, negative seven y, negative 10 z, and negative 15 plus four is negative 11. So we'll check this error out and then we'll take a break. X plus two y plus three z equals five. Now, what are we supposed to do here? Two sevenths, 20 sevenths, 21 sevenths. That's one seventh. Minus 22 sevenths, 35 sevenths. If you see the errors, 13 sevenths. If you see the error, top it off in the chat box. So very good, because we're going to have to go to a break and we're going to find the error. And I see your comment. So let's evaluate your comment. What we're going to do, let's take a break, come back in five minutes. Let's say back at 9.04. And then obviously something's wrong here because I got to be consistent with the direction vectors, right? Tolu's making a suggestion. Let's evaluate the suggestion and then correct this error. But First, stretch your legs. I'm going to stretch my legs, mute my microphone. Then we'll find out what went wrong.
Okay, we're back. And before we left, uh, you made the suggestion in the chat window that described my error. So thank you very much. When I multiplied minus two seven times equation A, I should have written positive two Y, <coughs> positive 27 C, positive 22 seven. Then two sevenths times that plus that, this was correct. X, no Y's, one seventh Z and 13 sevenths. I was concentrating on that. And then that presents these two equations as X equals minus one seventh plus 13 sevenths. And Y equals minus 10 sevenths Z plus 22 sevenths, divide out by the two. And Z can be anything we want. Sometimes we say Z is free. Z is free to be anything it wants. But I want you to see that immediately, that this is the equation of a line. Okay, I use Z instead of T, but this is the equation of a line. When two planes intersect, they intersect in a line. Well, again, they could be the exact same plane, and then they intersect in the whole plane, right? But I saw by the normal vectors, the normal vectors were not the same. If these were the same plane, they'd have the same normal. Or if they were parallel, they'd have the same normal. Here's the normal, three minus one minus one, one, two, three. Not parallel normals. But look at the equation of this line L2 now. You want me to write it out explicitly in terms of parameter t. I have minus one seventh t, minus 10 sevenths t, and one t, plus 13 sevenths, plus 11 sevenths, plus zero. That gives me a direction vector and a base point on this line number two. Line number two is the intersection of those planes schematically. Notice that this direction vector matches the direction vector here. So I do know that these lines are parallel. Even though they're not the same direction vector, they're multiples of each other. So they're parallel lines. Base point here was pretty, base point here is ugly. Now you could choose the base point here to be not ugly, but you don't always have freedom to do that when you're working with the fractions. You can scale up this direction vector all you want, but you can't scale up this point. So if I put a minus one in for T, look at that. If I put a minus one in for T, what point would I be at? That would put me at X equals 14 over seven, which is two. If I put a minus one in for T, that would put me at 21 over seven for Y, which is three. If I put a minus one in for T, does it give me Z equals minus one? So this point is also a base point for that line. Oh, do you realize what I'm saying? If that point's on the line and the line's in the intersection, that point better be what? On those two planes. How do we check that a point's on a plane? Using the standard form, the general form. Plug two, three, and minus one into here instantly and see if this point lies on those two planes. Six minus three plus one. Six minus three plus one is four. Two plus six minus three. Two plus six minus three is five. Everything is checking out, safety checks. Okay, I'm gonna do one more illustration of the value of normals, and then we're gonna to go to our other topic today, quadric surfaces. And But the quadric surfaces I'm gonna use in the same logic. Quadric surfaces are gonna depend on extending your knowledge of the plane space. So move some papers out of my way. Let's look at these two lines in space. Let's look at line one, which is uh, x equals one plus five t, y equals minus one minus two t, and z equals four plus t. 
let's just pick some lines here. Here's a second line. Let's say x equals minus t, y equals, you could say zero minus t, but minus t is just as good, three plus t. And you could say z equals minus one plus two t. Now notice, even though I write the t's in back this time, you have no problem picking out a base point and a direction vector on each line. On line one, for example, base point is one minus one, four. And the direction vector is five minus two, one. Now, if we talk about line two, you can pick out base point, zero, three, minus one. And direction vector minus one, one, two. Now I got to ask questions about these lines. And remember what lines can do in space. Lines in space, they could be parallel. I don't think these are parallel. They've got two direction vectors that don't line up, not parallel. They could be accidentally the same line. But again, that would put them in the context of parallel. If they're the same line, they're actually parallel too. They have the same direction vector or they have parallel direction vectors. These do not have parallel direction vectors. So none of this, none of this. So what are my last two options? The two lines could intersect in a point. And in the plane, that's the only three things that could happen. Parallel, coincident, intersecting. But in space, I have this other possibility. These two lines could never cross. And I kind of draw it with this perspective trick of drawing one line behind the other. But you can imagine two lines in space that never cross. I wanted to illustrate how to do this calculation. So how do we decide between these two cases? Well, we need to find the intersection point. If it exists. Just like in the last problem, I had to find the intersection line of two planes. Now I want to find the intersection point of two lines. And what does the intersection point of two lines mean? It means that they occupy the same point in space, x, y, and z. So for these two lines to intersect, the x and the y and the z have to be the same. But here's the catch. They don't have to be the same at the same time. So I equate the x's, I equate the y's. I equate the z's. Excuse me. But no one said these two planes have to meet at the same moment. That would be catastrophic. What happens if this line goes through a point in space at one time and the other line goes into the point, same point in space, but an hour later? Well, then there's no sweat, they don't collide. The planes don't collide, but the lines of their paths intersect. So now I'm doing another solve the equation. That's the theme I'm trying to show you that I solve systems of equations to find intersections. And I'm gonna use that again in a moment in the quadric surfaces. So let's solve these three equations. Now I'm gonna write them in a convenient form that is organizing the variables on one side. 
and organizing the constants on the other. I also like to lead with positive numbers. So I have 5t1 plus t2 is negative 1, 2t1 plus t2 is negative 4, and t1 minus 2t2 is negative 5. Now look at these things. Look at how this problem has been transformed. It does represent two lines in space. But I also want you to look at this and realize that this represents three lines in the plane. And what I'm trying to find is a point T1 and T2 in a plane that contains all three of these lines. Is that possible? Well, certainly it's possible, but it's rare. What does that tell you? Is it possible for two planes, sorry, two lines, two airplanes, but I wanna say, is it possible for two lines in space to intersect? Yes, it's possible, but it's rare. If you just throw two lines into space, they usually don't intersect. They usually don't land on each other and they usually aren't parallel. This word is skew. Coincident, parallel, intersecting, skew. Okay, let's solve this system right here. And the easiest way to solve the system, I could say, let's just solve these two and see if one answer that I get out of here fits into the first equation. So I could say T1 minus 2T2 is minus five. And I could say 2T1 plus T2 is minus four. This is two lines intersecting the plane. I can solve this by saying negative two copies of the first on the second give me zero T1s. Negative two copies of the first on the second, give me six T2s. And negative two copies of the first 10 on the second gives me six, right? That tells me that T2 is one. That's what I think. Of course, if T2 is one, I can go back and find T1. I can just say, what? Let's put one in here, negative two, add it to the other side. T1 must be negative three. So T1 is negative three, T2 is one. Notice how that satisfies both of these last two equations because that's the way I constructed. Negative three, I'm sorry. Oh, I must be making some error in that situation again because I better test these. If I put a one in here and add six, sorry, if I put a minus three in here, subtract two, I get negative five. If I put what do I have right here? I have this 2t2, which is wrong. So I'm being very careless there. Sorry about that. Let's try and solve these again. Minus two of here on here. Give me 5t2. Zero t1s, 5t2s, and six. Gives me t2 is six over five. This isn't gonna be pretty. Because if this is 6 over 5, this is minus 12 over 5. Add 12 over 5, this is minus 25 over 5. T1 is minus 13 over 5. I really don't appreciate that. But let's test it out right here. <sighs> minus 13 over 5, minus 12 over 5 is minus 25 over 5. Good. Minus 26 over 5 plus 6 over 5 is minus 20 over 5 is negative 4. Okay, that works. These two lines do intersect, which is not unnatural. The question is, if I put this numbers into the first one, do I get intersecting? 
what's five times minus 13 over five? Negative 13. What's adding six over five? Is that the same as negative one? Not quite sure what that is, but the answer is no. So what do I have here? I have two skew lines. There is no intersection point. What's a natural question to ask if two lines don't intersect? Two planes that are flying through the air. You always are asking, how close did those planes become? You wanna make sure those planes were never too close together or their flight paths were never too close together. Here I'm talking about their flight paths. And I'm making a schematic drawing. Here's L1 and L2. What's the distance? from L1 to L2. Well, I'm gonna think about this schematically and I'm gonna let you do the calculations. But what I have on L1 is a base point and a direction vector, right? What I have on L2 is a base point and a direction vector. Now, remember the animal that we talked about last week? The parallel of pipette? Take this vector V2 and translate it down here. Sit it at base one and then sketch parallelogram, parallelogram, and the parallelogram that connects these two lines. In other words, make this crystal, make this parallelogram between line L1 and L2. Do you see that? If I pick base points on the two lines and I pick direction vectors on the two lines, I naturally can build a crystal, a parallel pipette between the two lines. And then what am I gonna do to find the distance between the two lines? The distance between the two lines, if I translate it over, is the height of this box. Now, what's the volume of that box? P1, P2 is the vector that connects the two base points. I dot that with V1 cross V2 because that gives me the floor of that parallel pipe in. This is the volume of the parallel pipe in, I divide by the base area of the parallel pipe, pipe in. And what do you get when you divide volume by base? You get height. And you get the height of this parallel pipe in, which is the projection onto a normal line. Normal line was created by V1 cross V2. So you get the height of this parallel pipe in. Now, I'm gonna let you work this out and because I have not had a good day so far as not making errors. Why don't you work this out and you find the distance, the height between those. When I did it, I got 54 over root 155. That's ugly, about 4.34. But you take these two lines now that you know their skew, what could I ask you to do on a test? How far apart are they? How do you do that? You build the crystal on the two lines. There's another value of parallel pipette. That's another reason why parallel pipette is so valuable. Okay, you go check that out. I think it's 54 over root 155. And I do, I apologize for the error right here. And I thank you, Jacob, for pointing that out. I'm in too much of a hurry, but it's not simple to talk and do math at the same time, but that's an excuse. So thank you guys for paying attention.
Let's finish up our discussion today with an introduction to the quadric surfaces. And I also like to draw some of these in Mathematica for you. And I'll do that presently. But first, let me describe the quadric surfaces. These are the analog of the conic sections. Remember in the plane, conic section is parabola, ellipse, hyperbola. These are just three samples. There are many different parabolas. They could go oriented any way you please. There are many different ellipses. You can orient it tall, short, tilted. There are many different hyperbolas. But these are the so-called conic sections because if you take a traditional cone, which has two napes right here, then you slice that cone with a plane, you create one of these objects. If the plane is perpendicular, the plane is parallel to the axis of the cone, you create a hyperbola. These are called the conic sections. This is in the plane. What happens if they graduate to space? If they graduate to space, they're called the quadric surfaces. There are three classical conic sections. And you can have degenerate conic sections. You could have a plane intersect the cone only in a single point. You could have a plane intersect the cone in two crossing lines. Those are called degenerate conic sections. But regular conic sections, there are three varieties. Now let's pump these puppies up to space. These are called the quadric surfaces. And there's nine classical varieties of quadric surfaces. Let's give you the first analogy. Well, you know that if I say x squared over four plus y squared over one equals one, that's a classic description of an ellipse with x intercepts at plus minus two and y intercepts at plus minus one. You could express that differently. You could multiply all sides by four x squared plus 4, y squared equals 4. But people like this presentation because it shows the intercepts. Do you remember the intercept form of a line? Maybe you've never done the intercept form of a line, but don't disrespect it. It shows you the intercepts. Here, the classical equation of ellipse is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. And this a and minus a, this b and minus b, give you the major axis and the minor axis. Half of the major axis is the semi-major axis, the semi-minor axis. I'm not going to get into all those vocabulary words. You used to live them one day. But now, let's ask what happens if you have x squared plus 4y squared. plus nine z squared equals 36. I'm gonna introduce this to space by adding another perfect square. Let's use the same analogy I did with the plane. If I set this equal to one divided by 36, I get x squared over 36, y squared over nine, z squared over four. Of course, I picked this to be friendly, didn't I? What I've created, if you block out each two variables in turn, is I've created ellipses, but in three directions, plus or minus six on the y-axis, plus or minus three 
on the y-axis, plus or minus six on the x-axis, excuse me, plus or minus three on the y-axis, and plus or minus two on the z-axis. I gotta use my creativity right here. Draw in the xz plane, the yz plane, the yz plane and the xz plane and the xy plane. Well, this is terrible, but it looks like a football, looks like a bad football. For those of you who think footballs are always round, this is American football. Well, it's not an ellipse. This is an ellipse. The name of this is ellipsoid. This is such a bad drawing. I'm so upset by it. I think I'm going to go over to Mathematica and draw one for you nicely. I'm going to share this Mathematica window with you right now. And let me define an ellipsoid to be equal to, so I'm defining it. I will pump up my typing there. Contour plot, three dimensions. The command in Mathematica where I'm going to type in x squared plus 4y squared plus 39z uh, squared. That's going to run off the edge, isn't it? Uh, maybe my typing is too large. I think you can still read that reasonably. OK, a little space equals 36. Now, in Mathematica, there's a difference between colon equals, one equals, and two equals. Colon equals in the programming language is called set delayed. In other words, you're setting a variable definition, but you're not executing it. If you just wanted to do a simple execution of a variable like a equals four, then you just type a equals four. Shift return. And then the next time you ask Mathematica what 2a is, Mathematica will say eight. So a plain equal sign is just assigning a variable. A colon equal sign is called set delayed. It will accomplish the same thing, but it will not evaluate the variable when you define it. It'll evaluate it the next time you call it. So now a is set equal to four the next time I mention a. So 2a minus seven is one. So that's what equal sign means and colon equals means. But if you want to tell Mathematica to use math equals, like 2x minus seven equals four, use double equal sign. So now I've defined a mathematical equation. Let me do some spacing here so I can finish the problem neatly. Now I have to tell Mathematica where I want it to draw this ellipse, x, y, and z. I've already scoped out what it looks like, right? So let's say x goes from minus eight to eight, and let's keep things square. Let's say y goes the same way. I don't want two commas. Z goes the same way. I will draw this ellipsoid now. So I hit shift return. Mathematica does nothing. Why did it do nothing? Because I said colon equals. But now I want Mathematica to show me the ellipsoid. So I call the ellipsoid. There's the ellipsoid. The x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. Now, it's not so 
beautiful. And there may be some things I can do to make this more beautiful. But it was a long, thin football, right? So I guess I can't ask for too much. Notice how I can move that football around there. So contour plot 3D finds all the points that satisfy this equation. It tries to do its best job and then plots them. <coughs> how about let's decorate this. Let's say plot style is red. I'll do my indenting. The indenting doesn't affect the command here, right? But what the indenting does is let me see the arguments that I'm giving to the command. Now, Mathematic is screaming at me in red. Plot style is not an option for contour plot 3D. Well, how do I color this thing red? Well, if I read the instructions for contour plot 3D, I would have remembered that they call it contour style. Contour style red delivers what? Now, remember, I just assigned the variable. Now I'll show you the ellipsoid. Now I have a red ellipsoid. But it's still kind of hard to see right there. Why don't I clip down that box? You know, I gave eight to make the x-axis okay. How about giving uh, four on the y-axis? Because the y only goes out to three. How about giving three on the z-axis? Because the z only goes out to two. I could even clip this down to seven. Let's take a look. That doesn't look like a great representation of my football. And why is that? Because my units aren't matching anymore. How do I make my units match? Let's call another argument. How about box ratios? Box ratios sets the ratio of the three boxes or the three edges of this box. And basically I want a ratio of seven to four to three, or at least that's what I'm gonna try first seven units in the x-axis is four units in the y-axis is three units in the z-axis. Let's try my ellipsoid now. Ah, uh, good. I got a smoother ellipsoid and I've got it fitting better in that box. I'll show you one more killer trick for this ellipsoid. Let's not only make it red, but let's make it a little bit transparent. And the argument there is called opacity. Now I'm demonstrating these here, but I'm also demonstrating on the notebooks that I've put online in week two, three, four, et cetera. Now what I'm gonna do is transparency factor of 20%. So that's gonna be rather transparent. Now I have my same ellipse, but it's kind of transparent. You say, wow, transparent, but I don't really see that transparency because I got all these jumbled lines in here. These jumbled lines are called the mesh. Let's say mesh is none. Notice how Mathematica wants you to know what the correct arguments are, whereas maybe you haven't heard of mesh, but let's try mesh equals none. Now I have a transparent football. And it's a little bit annoying because it's like hard to distinguish from projections of ellipses. Let's try another trick though. Let's do another object. How about a cylinder? How about a cylinder that's made out of a circle, right? Circular cylinder. And let's set that to be x squared plus y squared equals some nice number like one. Now I got my right circular cylinder here. I execute, of course, nothing happens. I have to show you the right circular cylinder. Do you notice how Mathematica gives me this tip? 
oh, a second ago, you began a variable with R-I-G-H. Do you want to use that variable? Sure, I do. Now here, Mathematica is telling me something is wrong. So I got to figure out what's wrong right here. Ellipsoid right circular cylinder is incomplete. More input is needed. Okay, what I need to do is not separate them by commas. I could type them like this. And then I get the two objects separated. I can type them in braces. Then I will separate by commas. And that's kind of nice because it shows them side by side. But it would be super cool if I could show them on top of each other. Let's pump up the width of that thing, by the way. Let's say, let's make this a, maybe let's make it a four. Not sure what will happen, but let's try four. How do I show those two in the same box? That's the show command. Let's show the ellipsoid that I defined and the right circular cylinder that I defined in the same box. Okay, this is interesting. This shows the intersection happening between those, but it's not too awesome because the color difference. Let's try a different color for the cylinder. Blue. Oh, by the way, I don't think I re-executed after I hit this four and this blue. So let's re-execute this because that redefines the right circular cylinder. I think the right circular cylinder should be larger than that. Oh, now I see that cylinder going through this. It might be a little bit better if I use different transparencies in the two objects. Why don't I use a little bit less transparency in the right circular cylinder? Okay, what if I used mesh on the other one? You know what I could do to not type that, I could comment it out. Just hit command slash or control slash. You comment in Mathematica with parentheses, asterisks, asterisk parentheses. Now I've commented out mesh equals none. Of course, if I do that, I will get an error report right here. Oh, crazy error happened. What crazy error happened? Options expected beyond position four and contour plot. Now that's a fancy way of saying you commented out mesh equals none, but you left a comma in there and it was waiting for something else. I either have to erase or comment out that comma. Okay, now let's run it. Okay, now I see that ellipse, that ellipsoid in red being cut by that cylinder blue. I think I'm going to reverse this and say, let's make the cylinder more, not less transparent, and let's make the ellipsoid more transparent. You know, we could experiment with this. Let's try this. So now it's the ellipsoid that's transparent and the cylinder that's more opaque. That might be a nice thing to look at. Or we could reverse the two. Let's call this one seven, 70%, and let's call this one 20%. Nothing happened, because I didn't re-execute this line. Show this line. You know, I'm going to have to experiment with my transparencies, but each one of them shows me something different. Notice the intersection between these two is something that's circular from above but kind of like saddle shaped from this perspective, elliptical from that perspective. I could have made this cylinder off center by doing all sorts of things, right? So you've learned how to move things around in the plane by doing what? Translations. So now this right circular cylinder is used one, one unit forward. And uh, 
let's move it two units in the y direction. Now that right circular cylinder is doing what? Only clipping or biting off a piece of that ellipsoid. Okay, so I want to show you a basic way of executing a comparison of these two. These are two quadric surfaces. The blue thing is an ellipsoid. Well, it's a right circle. It's a circular ellipsoid. I'm sorry, it's a circular cylinder. It's what you call a cylinder. Let me go back to my paper right now and give you the full characterization of the quadric surfaces. And we can explore this further as we go along, but the conic sections, there are three non-degenerate cases. The quadric surface in space, you have nine varieties. You can have the cylinders, like pretend you have a parabola, it slides up and down one axis. It's like a sheet of paper that's been bent into a trough. That's a parabolic cylinder. You could have like what I had in my demonstration right now, an ellipse or a circle that slides up and down one axis. That's called an elliptic cylinder. Or you could have, this is harder to draw, a hyperbola in two axes, and you could slide that hyperbola up and down. It's kind of like two snow plows that are back to back. This is a hyperbola that's slid in one direction. This is called a parabolic cylinder. An elliptic cylinder. And this is called a hyperbolic cylinder. It's like you're ignoring one direction when you speak about cylinders. So these are called the classical cylinders. And then you could have something that you might think is more like a parabola in space. Let's take a parabola, but instead of sliding on the axes, let's spin it around the z-axis and create what? A bowl? a cup, a parabolic cup. Well, this is a parabola, but its cross sections are ellipses. So this is called an elliptic parabola, elliptic paraboloid in space, paraboloid. Or you could have like what we just drew in Mathematica, an ellipse in three directions, a football in three directions. If all three intercepts were the same, this would be a sphere. But if you have three ellipses in all three different directions, like the football we drew, this is called an ellipsoid. And the third version of this, concentrating on ellipses, is what happens if you have ellipses only in one direction and the other cross sections are different. This is the elliptic cone.
And all three, all six of these, all nine when I'm done, they're going to be variations of this object. Just like this is for hyperbola, x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared is one. That's a hyperbola. You change that plus sign to a minus sign from the ellipse, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is one. Ellipse with a plus sign, hyperbola with a minus sign. Well, here I've got different places I could put minus sign. These are called the elliptics. Everybody has different names for doing these, but I'm giving you a common name. And then what happens if you concentrate on hyperbolas? Well, you could concentrate on hyperbolas in this way. You could have hyperbolas in two directions and make bowls out of them, kind of like a radar dish. A radar dish is actually an elliptic paraboloid, but you could have a hyperbolic dish like this. These are called the hyperbolics. This is a hyperboloid. of two sheets, the two dishes. You could have a hyperboloid in one plane, and then you could spin that around the z-axis to create a little nuclear power plant smokestack. Cross sections are hyperbolas or ellipses. Cross sections are hyperbolas or ellipses, but oriented differently. This is called a hyperboloid. Of one sheet, excuse me. And the last hyperbolic is the hardest and most annoying one to draw, but it's the most famous one. What happens if you had a parabola in one direction and then on the other axis, you put the parabola in the other direction. Parabola in the YZ plane, parabola in the XZ plane, like you're sitting on the saddle of a horse. And then here's the annoying part. You try to draw that saddle surface. That is ultimate fail right there. The equation we'll give you later. This is called a hyperbolic paraboloid. Now we're going to cut it off here in just a second. Let me get my paper organized better. Just like there are many varieties of parabola, ellipse, hyperbola, just by changing constants. Well, now you could expect there are many, many varieties of the quadric surfaces set by changing constants. The hyperbolic paraboloid means if you cut it in cross sections parallel to the xy plane, here you'll get hyperbola cross sections in those two ways. But if I cut it with the XZ or YZ plane, I get parabolas that are oppositely oriented. Some people call it the potato chip surface. It's like a Pringles potato chip. So with different varieties of plus minus signs, by leaving off variables, the cylinders are created by drawing a parabola ellipse or hyperbola and leaving off one of the variables. If I say x squared plus y squared equals 36, you say that's an ellipse in the plane. Ah, but I call it an elliptic cylinder in space. So by messing with the plus and minus signs, by leaving variables out or setting the variable only to the first power, an elliptic paraboloid, like z equals x squared plus y squared, 
draw that in Mathematica. That gives you that cup. But if you draw z equals x squared minus y squared in Mathematica, that gives you that potato chip. So different combinations of numbers, signs, and powers give you what? These nine quadric surfaces. You want to be able to recognize them by their cross sections. And we can talk more about recognizing them later. But these are the nine fundamental surfaces of space. We're gonna study surfaces in general, but these are the nine fundamental surfaces in space called the quadric surfaces. In the introduction to this week, I told you in a sense on our website, what I mean by fundamental. These are the surfaces you get if all you allow are powers of one and two on your variables x, y, and z. If you only allow degree one terms on your variables, what do you get? You get a plane. That's the most basic one-dimensional animal in space. But if you allow the variables to have powers of two or one, then you get these fundamental two-dimensional animals, the quadric surfaces. You could also mix variables. You could say x, y equals z. Now, we're not going to be mixing and rotating so much, but that also happens to be a potato chip. That happens to be a hyperbolic paraboloid. And this is degree two, but we're gonna leave it to your linear algebra class to talk about the rotations of the quadric surfaces. Right now, I just want you to know the fundamental categories and where they came from. Okay, apart from the math errors, we did better. Hopefully we didn't screw up the recording, but I want you to see the analogies between all the things you learned in the plane and all the things we're learning in space. This almost terminates our tour of space. We haven't done any calculus yet. But when we come back next time, we're going to begin doing calculus in space after we make one more comment about describing things in space and alternate coordinate systems. So you start to work on these surfaces, play with Mathematica. I want you to do some intersection for me in the next homework. You can come back and give me questions about the intersection or send me Mathematica notebooks you're working on. But now it's time for you to dive into Mathematica. Now, people will consume this recording later, but I'm going to stop recording now.